to it. Um, so yeah, thank you very much everyone for coming. So obviously I'm Sam and I work for Qualcomm. So I work on the permanent side of the test market. Um, and George Lund, my colleague there, if you can see him, yeah, he works on the, I think most people know us anyway, but if you haven't um, met us before, then obviously this is a, a pretty good chance too. But like I say, I've got four really, really good panelists here. So without sort of further ado, what I'll do is I'll pass over so they can introduce themselves and then we'll get stuck into the first topic. So Beth, if you'd like to like to introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm Beth Hughes. Uh, I'm the test, well, a test lead um, at Talk Talk. I've been at Talk Talk for literally two weeks shy of a year. Um, so I joined last August. Before that, I did. Uh, I was test lead at M Brown um, for, for for three years. So, yep. That's awesome. Me. Cheers, Beth. Um, I guess we'll go in the in the order of the the topics as well. So, Stuart Wildman, um, would you like to introduce yourself, mate? Hi there. Yes, uh, test manager at the BBC. I head up a, a team of other test managers. We work on the enterprise side of um, of the BBC, so n nothing customer facing or websites or apps, but a, a lot of the back end, a lot of the Microsoft and um, business systems and other sort of areas. Twenty plus years working at various places, such so as quite a bit of time at Cap Gemini. Okay. That's from awesome. Myself. Cheers, Stuart. And I think so. Next would be Lee. Lee, I think uh, a lot of people know you anyway, but uh, would you like to introduce yourself, mate? <laughs> yeah, of course. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Lee Rathbone. I've uh, been in testing, uh, like Stuart, more than 20 years. Worked on some really cool tech uh, the world's first touchscreen smartphone, uh, the world's first smartwatch. Uh, worked for 10 companies across that 22 years, and I'm currently seeking new employment. So I can't tell you what company I work for <laughs> because I left them last week. <laughs> If anybody wants anyone to uh, get in touch, but uh, yeah, cheers for that, Lee, mate. But uh, yeah, last and by no means least, Stuart, if you'd like to introduce yourself as well, mate. Yeah, cheers, Sam. Uh, yeah, so I'm Stuart. Um, I'm principal QA at a company called Dunelm. Um, been there for, well, in two, two sittings, uh, three years, uh, with a little bit of a break in between. Um, over those 23 years um, in this space, I've been... Um, very much focused in different roles within quality. So management, leadership, you know, um, actual testing roles themselves. And, you know, obviously there's so much has changed in that time. It's, it's crazy. Um, and obviously the topics we're going to touch on today are going to be very much focusing on a lot of those things. So, um, so yeah, that's me. Awesome. Cheers for that, guys. Um, yeah, so basically it might be worth noting as well that the, um, the particular topic, sorry, you can hear some stuff in the background, but the... Uh, all the topics that we're going to be discussing, if you do have any questions, just pop them in the chat at the bottom. Um, and then essentially what I'll either do is direct it to whoever you want the, the question to go towards. Um, and if they don't answer it in the, uh, in the chat box below, then what I'll do is I'll essentially address it whilst we, we go through the, the topics. But without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll kick off. So Beth, I know we're coming to you for the first one. So the first topic that we're going to discuss is how to, how to sort of look after the test team and how to take care of the community. So I know a lot of companies uh, have really sort of tried quite, quite hard to establish a community. It doesn't, doesn't matter on the size of the business. Um, and I think that was a really interesting one. So Beth, how, how have you sort of managed to, to do that during lockdown? Um, so, okay, so go, go back. As, as I said, I, I've been with TalkTalk Talk for, for 12 months, um, thereabouts. And, and one of the reasons that I joined TalkTalk Talk was because they have a very community-focused culture. Um, we have a lot of community groups that are based around social interests um, and you're given the time to go and attend them. You're, you're given the time to go and join and be a part of those, those kind of things. Um, and we just started to build a testing community within TalkTalk. Um, we've done some events, we'd sponsored some internal events, we've done external events and we were just starting to look at where we could go from here um, and obviously lockdown happened and everything basically got mossballed, um, whether it was the Manchester tech scene or whether it was the talk talk testing. Um, and I think in the, the lockdown period, community personally is something that is even more important than it was before lockdown um, because we're all now sat at home behind computer monitors um, and it's great, we're connected. We've got Zoom, we've got chat, we've got Teams, whatever you may be using. We're more connected than we, we ever were before, but actually it's very easy to then be disconnected. Um, partly because 
you kind of almost forget there's a human on the other end of that screen, if you, if you, if you get me. Um, and it's really important that when we're, we're interacting with people that, that we're remembering that. Um, from the community side, Talk Talk, I think we, we had about two weeks of, of sort of radio silence and then we basically took everything online. Um, and the Talk Talk wider community have been great because we've, we've had everything from Mr. Motivator in the mornings um, right through to cook alongs with the hairy bikers um, and, and just keeping that fun alive, which I think is something that, that, that gets lost. Um, now, I'm, I'm like the most introverted of introverts. I, I, you know, I'd rather not talk to anybody all day if I can possibly get away with it. Um, but I still miss that community. I still miss that, that free flow of ideas. Um, and what we're looking at is how we can bring that back within the testing community, specifically in Talk Talk, but also in sort of the wider area and, and things like this. You know, we st we've gone online. We're, we're, we're adapting. We're changing. We're, we're looking at the different ways of doing it. Um, and, and one of the things that we've been doing is actually having a, a quarantine postal exchange just to keep that fun element because you're never quite sure what the postman is going to bring you. Um, it's like Secret Santa essentially. Um, and it, it, it just keeps that human, that human side, um, which I think you get from the kind of the community, from the, the, the bit I always enjoyed was actually the, the bit where you had the beer and the pizza afterwards. It wasn't necessarily sitting and listening to the talks because I'm sure we would all say they, they do get a little samey after a while. There is only a certain number of, uh, of, of topics that we can cover. Um, and I think at the moment there is a big danger that people because we're isolated because we're sat behind our monitors that we actually lose that bigger picture we lose that identity and you return almost to that siloed way of thinking um which we need that space to retain that identity to to be creative and how we're, we're engaging with each other now um and i think i was going back to say that the, the sort of the way that we communicate with people is something that we all need to be very aware of um, particularly if we're um, leads mentors um, coaches we all are on here we're all we're all leaders in some way whether we have direct reports or not um, and I think we have a big big role to play in understanding the pressures that are going on behind those screens now and making sure that people are okay doing that health check if I'm in the office and I want you to do something, I'll look across. I can see that you're overwhelmed. I can see that you're in the middle of something. I can see that, you know, 15 people have come and talked to you in the last 20 seconds. Um, I know that actually if I go over to you and go, Oi, Sam, I need, you're either going to break down, shout at me, or, you know, totally, totally lose the plot and whatever you're doing. But now that I'm on Slack, all I know is there's a little green dot in the corner that says you're available. I can't see what's your, what you're doing. I can't see that, I don't know, the dog's just been sick downstairs or your kids are playing up or you're worrying about something or you're in the middle of the report from hell and you're trying to work out all that information. And I think, so I, if, if when we're typing as well, um, you have a tendency to, to almost forget the politeness the, the, the niceness, um, if you like. So rather than me coming over and going, hey, Sam, can we have a chat? When you've got five minutes, can you just, you type in it, you're cutting down on those words, let's face it, it takes a while to take those keys. Um, and suddenly that, that would you mind becomes a you will, I need, I want. Um, and we all know that those kind of requests put you back up. And you know, you're not always gonna appreciate that they're coming in and people get overwhelmed and stressed. And, and I think as leaders and as community, we, we need to be very mindful of, of how other people are feeling and remember that there's a human on the other side of that and remember that we're, we're all part of a family, we're all part of, of, of a community um, who should be there to support each other. Um, so one of the things that I'm personally trying to do is every day I'll go and talk to somebody that I don't need to talk to. I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily working with them at that particular moment. I'm not, and I'll ask them how they are and I'll actually listen to what they're saying. 
um, because there is a tendency just to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so you're fed up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to look at another screen. I'm going to do something else. But if you give somebody that five minutes of time and just make sure that they're okay, um, I think that continues to build the community. And, and when we all do get back together, I think then it's it, it's something that is going to only be a good thing and, and to sort of, it will improve the way that our communities work. Um, we're now looking at what else we can do. We're looking at how we can take our technical um, community online and, and, and sponsor events and get back into that whole Manchester tech scene um, that, we, that we were in. How we're going to do it, I think we're going to have to be creative. I think you have to look at things like this. I think another great thing is doing this during the day um, because if you're doing it in the evening, our days are stretched long enough as it is. You know, we, we were laughing and talking before before the, this meeting started and, and you guys are all aware that I've got quite a lot on at the moment. Um, and days stretch, you know, you come in, particularly if you've got nothing else to do. So you've watched all the box sets, let's face it. Um, and you'll come in, you'll log on half seven in the morning, you'll get some work done and you look at your clock and you think, oh, right, okay, it's now half seven at night and I haven't had tea and I haven't gone away and I haven't got away from my desk. And I think you do have to get up and say, right, okay, if I was commuting, I've got rid of the commute and that's really great, but actually my commute times are now kept in work time. So I can now say, right, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take my break. I'm going to, and that, that's a learning that I'm, I'm trying to take personally as well. Um, so I, I think it, it's just, for, for we, we're, we're in a learning period at the moment um, and uh, we're, we're kind of looking around and going hey this is the new normal it's not going away we have to adapt to the way that we work to the way that we think um, heck I, I have to explain to my mom how to use zoom now so she can she can attend the WI meetings um, so if even even the WI are embracing zoom um, you know then kind of the rest of us have no excuse do we but I think I think for me, it is just about making sure that people are okay, making sure that you keep it human, making sure that you are, are polite and that you, you, you maintain that kind of humanity. Because I think there's a big danger that we'll lose sight of the community, we'll lose sight of humanity, and you just become a robot on the back of a screen with a little green dot that says you're available or not, as the case might be. So yeah, those are kind of my thoughts. Yeah, for sure. Cheers for that, Beth. I, uh, I've seen you've got your, your hand up there, Lee. <laughs> yeah, a, a great intro, Beth. Um, I'm looking at the comments on, in the chat. There's a load of people saying everything you're saying is really relevant and spot on. I think what I'd add or, or questions to the panel is, first of all, my thoughts are the every company is in survival mode. And when you're in survival mode, things change. People's mannerisms change. And what I've seen change is top leadership. So what value do top leadership put on to people who go around asking, are you okay? Instead of thinking about the deliverables, some people like to think about people and have those chats, as Beth has said, those five minute chats, how are you? Keeping people sane, keep, keeping people from having the wobbles. I don't think top leadership have value in that. And I, I've seen that firsthand they value code going through the door. So my question to the other panelists is, have you seen the same from top leadership or are they genuinely seeing value from leaders who take time out to say, how are you to the rest of the community? Um, in, our, in my area, so I can only speak to, you know, my part of the, uh, of the BBC, our leaders have been pretty good that from the get-go, they, they identified you know, all the things that we know now, you know, Zoom overload, too many meetings, um, and they really put, a, maybe, it's the, maybe it's just the, per, the company that I work for, but they really put forward um, to the managers and to the team leaders to speak to your team and then to feedback. And then they, they're on calls um, when they had them on talking about putting time out for yourself. And really, there was some, some of them were really good at saying, look, your family comes first. End of the day, if you're, if you're having problems, if you're having difficulties, you know, just come and say to us. And if you need to take time away, just do it. And so it's been quite nice that 
if you, you know, the, the, some of the people have had challenges where both parents are still working and they've got kids and they've had to go into a shift rotor. And so someone's getting starting work at, say, seven in the morning or even earlier and doing their shift. And then the next one's coming in and working later. And the management are being pretty supportive of this, you know, which is, which is nice. And of course, the events as well that Beth said. So I've only seen a, a positive but I can definitely understand there would be a negative from some areas, especially if you if you if you were driven to hit targets. Yeah, I think I think from from our perspective, I think when we went when we went into lockdown, I mean, we 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 thrive on the community spirit at Dunelm. It's part of the culture, um, and you know, we we work really hard in in bringing. You know, we've got offices in London, we've got offices in Leicester, we've got people out in Portugal, you know, we, we thrive on trying to bring all those people together regularly face to face if we can in, in most, most situations. Um, and that, that hit us quite hard to start with. And I think, um, sort of within the first four weeks of lockdown, when, you know, when you know, stores ended up shut in, we had to take the website offline. People were kind of, where do we go? What do we do? And there was a lot of panic and, you know, coming in, um, focusing back on to like Lee's point, survival mode. What do we do? And the, the the eye kind of shifted away from people as people. And you you heard like terms come in like resource. Do we have the resource to do this? Do we have you know? And it was like, oh, hold on, guys. Remember where we're at. And you know, um, you know, we've always thrived on and, and prided ourselves on people come first. Um, and we had to keep reminding ourselves of that. Um, and I think as we've gone through this and it's been a bit of a roller coaster. You know, every every day to start with was crazy. Now every week, and you know, it's it's gradually, gradually, gradually settling down, and we're starting to get back to that now. And I think the um, the way the ways in which we communicate, the ways in which we collaborate, and, and you know, and, and really kind of bring those communities together, obviously, it's changed. Um, but I think the, the want and desire from the leadership at Dunelm is still there, but they. And, and we do work on a very kind of transparent communication up the chain as well. Um, so when we have felt that, well, we're, we're kind of stepping over the mark here, we need to get back to our values. They've heard that and essentially kind of gone to us to say, how, okay, how can, how can you guys help it? You know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll support you. What do you need to do? So, you know, we've, we've um, put in like end, end of weekly drinks and, you know, just things to kind of keep those, those um, fun times going. Um, and I think it, it's definitely helped. But like Beth said, I do weekly one-to-ones with my guys. It might have been bi-weekly. But this is not about how, you, how you're getting on work-wise. This is about how are you and how are you feeling today? Not tomorrow, not yesterday, but today. How, what, is, what is going on in your world? Um, and I've learned so much from that. I've learned, you know, I've really got to know all my team so much more just actually over the last few weeks even though I thought I knew them really well it's, it's crazy the things I now know about them <laughs> you know <laughs> some good some bad but you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing so you know it really is like there's pros and cons to all of this and I think definitely yeah for sure uh, yeah cheers for that everyone it was uh, yeah r- r- really good thoughts um, I think going back to it, so I know uh, th- this is something that's definitely stayed with me, especially since we've been talking quite a lot about, about the event and everything, Lee. But when you say go into survival mode, I think it sort of leads quite nicely onto the next topic. Um, so the next topic is c- how coronavirus has affected. And obviously we, we know that with you, Stuart, it has, Stuart Ardman, that is, sorry, uh, Stuart, it, you have been affected quite, quite a lot in terms of delivery um, due to coronavirus and going into this survival mode. So how has it sort of affected you at the, uh, the BBC? Okay. So it's affected, when you say me at the BBC, it, yeah. in my area of the BBC, because this is, <laughs> I'll, always, I'll always caveat it, as, as we all do in our company. So my area is a lot of enterprise solutions. Um, and uh, so my team are working across the board. So some, some projects, such as the Wi-Fi upgrade, that actually got put on pause. The uh, the uh, the, the, the um, looking at Zoom rooms and meeting rooms that that got put on pause as well. There was a, a less less need for them, but it, it, it's still you know continuing. But in other areas, we saw a massive acceleration. So we we're doing a lot of work with um, with Teams and rolling that out, and with Zoom. Um, 
and then we're doing a lot of work with our internal community with our communications our vpn clients and so we saw overnight as everyone else did that especially for the people who run the vpn it, it's never been designed for everyone to be working from home and there was panic you know a lot of teams were like oh my can, can these systems hold um and it was really nice to see that people really pulling together and all of a sudden you're on calls and i I, f I feel like that when I'm on the Zoom call now, I'm here, I'm looking around, I can see David, Jen, Simon, I can see the faces, and you can really see the expressions better than in a meeting room, that you, you were there with people, your peers, and, and you were listening to what they were saying, and you, all of a sudden you realize you, you have got some really good people you're working with, some great experts in their areas. So we saw some, you know, some, some speed, and because for example, let's take it our VPN solution hasn't been designed for the whole of the BBC to work from home. So what, what do you do? Well, you need to upgrade it very quickly. You need to, you, need, you know, you got InfoSec, you've got performance in, involved, you've got the architects involved and you've got the manager saying, look, we need it as soon as possible. You know, we need to make sure it, it will survive and it will stand up. Um, but of course we know there's going to be downtime. So the risk profile and reevaluation, the risk started to change. And that was talked about a lot more. Because you know you, you've you you've got you need to have the speed of the upgrades, but if you bring down something like email, you know if your your exchange online or your Zoom, or if you bring it down, then people can't work, and it's not just a few people; it's the whole of the company was hit. So it was really interesting to have those dis discussions because we all talk about risk-based testing. And we all, you know, we talk about it and look at it and just discuss it. And, you know, in some, in definitely if you're in an area such as Stuart in Dunelm, if you're doing something that's website, you know, for the customer, um, you know, you'd be looking at a very, it'd be very important for, for what I do and for my areas. It's, it's been a lot. It's been really interesting to see how people are looking at that and looking at how that, um, how that was being reviewed. That was really interesting. Um, picking up some of the points about, um, about how it's changed and how it's altered. So Beth was talking about, you know, her mother using Zoom. What I noticed was that across, across the BBC, we have some different users, different technology sort of experiences. Um, but we, we often use them for our UAT. If you're doing internal systems, you want to use the actual internal users going to feed back. And I noticed that my internal user started becoming a lot more tech savvy and actually more willing to help out and more willing to work with us all of a sudden i don't know you know it was it was when we we're reaching out to people and saying you know okay look we've got an, we've got this new solution we, we're looking we're looking at teams we're looking at rolling it out you know can you get on board and test it and they were they were at the beginning they were like they were, they were joking in the conversations well i've just i've just learned how to use house party so uh, and they were becoming more open open to change and open to technology and that was again really nice from from my point of view to see that you know to see that what i thought would be some negatives and, and people going into bunkers and not being you know, in silos they actually became more open and more open to technology which is fed into what we're doing um coming back to the so sort of looking at the, the title of the accelerated delivery as well there has been um a, a concern of mine that we could be going too quickly in some areas um and you know it, we're having to look at the process that we follow in in some respects we've we talked about the the risks talking about you know moving at pace but you also have to you also have to look at what you're doing in testing and in some areas and this this happens no matter with covid or not is that there is a desire to move forward get releases out get change out um and what we needed to do was come back and to reassess and reevaluate and look at the processes that we were following and make sure that we're still following the correct process we're doing the due diligence we we're looking you know doing our showcases doing our ex exit gate meetings to make sure that you just just because it needs to happen quickly we weren't we weren't introducing errors into the uh into the clients so really for me the how things have altered um and how the delivery is altered it's increased it's it's gone manic as everyone's has said we've been working longer hours um and maybe it will start to tail off now uh, and it'll be interesting to see how we we go long term but it's been really nice it's been really good um just about survived it we're st still here the technology <laughs> still stood up that's that's been quite good
Sure. Cheers for that, Stuart. Um, I'm going to go to to the other Stuart because I know that since you've uh, since lockdown, uh, especially with Dunelm, I know you've sort of moved over towards more of a uh, what what's the word? I guess more of a focus onto your your sort of tech platform and your digital presence. How how has it affected you since uh, since coronavirus first came in? Yeah. So I think so. For those that don't know, um, we actually replatformed the Dunelm. Uh, site back in October last year. So there's there around about a 12 month, 18 to 12, uh, 12 to 18 month project where we went from a um, IBM WebSphere commerce platform that was old creaking to an in-house built microservice, all bells, whistles, all the, all the good, you know, techie talk stuff. Right. Um, and our biggest concern when we launched that in October was how is it going to stand up to our Christmas peak sales? And that was always a problem for us. Christmas peak sales is always a problem for us. Um, and so we were focused purely on that, how we get over it. And, and we flew. We, we were so amazing, right? So we put in all the, um, the performance testing up front and all this great stuff. The architecture was sound. Um, and come out of, uh, after Christmas peak and we were like, okay, right, now let, let's, let's carry on developing the platform, doing all this great stuff. Oh, COVID's here. And then it was kind of like, we realized very, very quickly at that point that um, whilst we'd built a platform that was, could handle our, our, what we knew our customer behavior was like at that time and the volumes, we had no clue of what this world was now going to be. We shut down our stores. And I remember the day we shut down our stores, we were all, all the guys in the digital space were going, oh, we're cool. We've got our, 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 our website. We're still going to make money. And at the same time that evening, we got a message to say, guys, we're taking the website offline. And we were like, okay. But then <laughs> reality kicked in that our warehouses weren't set up for social distancing. We couldn't safely deliver any of our products. So whilst the website could deal with it, our downstream systems couldn't. Um, so but then we had to try and main maintain the presence that we had out there in the markets and say, don't worry, guys, we're, we're coming back. We just need to do this. So we had to very quickly... Um, adapt our, our offering online to just be browse only and then within 48 hours bring it back up so that only supply products of a particular nature that certain couriers could handle and it was really it, it really brought to light how whilst we developed a platform we thought was really robust and great it, it enabled us to actually flex really quickly as well in areas we didn't realize we we're going to have to flex in we never thought we'd have to switch all these products off because we couldn't deliver them it was never a thought in when we were, we were building the platform. Um, but then another, another um, kind of dawn, you know, something else dawned on us in the fact that, uh, oh God, we're the only selling platform Dunelm has now. So all of a sudden, all our store, all our store traffic is going to come to our site. What is that going to mean? So we'd spent a lot of time studying our customer behavior only to now just be like, we have no clue what this is going to do. <laughs> So we obviously had to really kind of uh, adjust really quickly in, in that space. And some of the, some of the um, legacy tech that we still had on the platform that we were like, over the next X months, we will gradually roll that off. We're fine. We've got plenty of time. All of a sudden become that much more important because we knew there was no way it was going to handle the, the, the additional traffic coming through. So we had to really pivot really quickly. Um, and luckily, you know, we, we built our, uh, our speed to production with our pipelines and our CI capabilities, you know, to handle the, to get stuff out quickly. Um, but the volume of change that was going through and coming back to Stuart's point, we felt like we were actually moving too fast in some instances. Um, and I've always been a, an ambassador of, of slow down to speed up. And it was one of the things I, I really encouraged the guys to do when I rejoined Dunnell because they were just trying to move too quick on everything. Um, so we had to try and like think of those things again and performance became that much bigger um, piece of the pie for us at that point. Even though it was very important, it became that much bigger. Um, so we've learned a lot with that. And you know, I, I, I'm pleased to say that we survived and we, you know, the, the platform is thriving. If we were on the old platform, who knows? I don't even think we'd have got past day one, in, in all fairness. So if COVID had hit six months before, we may have had been having a different conversation right now. Um, but you know, it's, it's opened our eyes up to a lot. Um, we can handle the change, but that change and that pivot is really, you know, was really hard. 
This is, um, yeah, no, really interesting. Cheers for that, Stuart. I think this is a, a question either to Stuart or the rest of the panellists. So if anything like this was to happen again, would you say that you're more, more equipped to deal with that or have you got process in place to, to, to sort of plan around stuff, uh, something like this happening again? Or? So, yeah, I mean, so, so from our perspective, we've, we've definitely learned from that. So we've now got, you know, on-off capabilities on, on the site to switch certain products off and, you know, all this, all the stuff that we've learned, we didn't just hack it in and then pull it out. It was, you know, we built this to actually last us moving forward. And actually our roadmap and our backlog has accelerated within the tech digital space, even into what tech can we now throw into our stores to support this. So we've, we've been looking at virtual queuing so people don't have to queue outside in the rain. How can they, you know, there, there's so many different things we're now thinking about. It's really shifted our focus and our mindset. Fantastic. Cheers, Stuart. Um, I think with, uh, so I, th I think we will move on to the next topic just because um, I think it is one of the, one of the ones which I'm really interested to hear about. And I'm sure a lot of people are as well. Um, but I think with, so Lee, we'll come to you for this one. So I know um, we had a really good discussion, all of the panelists last week about it. And I think um, just the future of testing, what are your thoughts and which, well, like what way is testing going? Wow. Um, where, to, <laughs> where to start with where that one? Start? <laughs> this feels like a, a whole meetup or even an all day conference all on its own. But I will give you an insight into what's in my, my tiny brain. Um, I think with testing, just like everything like fashion and with tech, it goes through trends. And if I think back to 2011, James Whitaker stood on a stage in Manchester and announced that testing was dead. Um, we saw some fallout from that. We saw some CTOs go back and just cancel their test teams almost overnight. And, and James, James Whitaker got a lot of flack for that, to be honest. And the other trends I've seen is this trend to, um, so from testing was dead, uh, people got rid of their test teams, then went, shit, we need our test teams back and re-employ testers again. And Google did in 2009. They got rid of all their testers, 2011 employed them all again. Um, so we've had the testing is dead trend. And, and then we've had this, this automation trend, haven't we, that's, that's hit for many, many years. And um, I think the latest trend will be um, the following. When I, when I recruit, when I look for a great tester, I no longer look for an automation tester. If you have automation testers or an automation team, that is a handoff. And I don't believe in ag agile or being, you know, showing agility. I, I, I believe in reducing those handoffs. So for me, I think the way the shape of testing needs to be is testers need to carry that metaphorical toolbox around with them. And they can open that toolbox in the day and they can pull things out, certain skills, certain traits, certain uh, behaviours. And I'll just bring some of those to life. Question asking is a key skill. Every tester should have that in their toolbox. Every tester should be able to ask questions around quality of security testing, performance testing. They don't need to be the person that does it. They need to drive those rich conversations. In the toolbox, they need to be able to understand the different layers and pair with devs and talk about unit testing. They should be code savvy. Okay, so I'm being controversial now. They should be code savvy or at least be able to write code as well. They should be able to talk through the stack. The automation should be minimal at UI and massive down the stack the further you go, so shift left. I think as well that toolbox, um, you know, it's going through the agile testing quadrants and driving those conversations, being the SME for quality and testing, not just in the squad, but outside. So we know all about shift left, but how about this for shift right? Shift right to me means pressing stop as an agile team or any team that you are in and giving the software to the user and getting that quantitative and qualitative feedback from the users. And that I feel is a skill the testers need. And if we think about other trends, think about cloud, the skills of the tester in cloud, you have to think about scalability, performance, security, they are absolutely key. Testing for money, testing for costs. Since when has that been a skill of a tester? But it will be. And if we then think about all the different technologies, UIOT is all massively messaging based. Big data is all around performance and security. Um, AR, VR, these are all technologies we've got to get used to, voice. So I'll give you an example. When Alexa came out, I went and bought the Alexa the day it came out in the UK. I went and bought it because I was curious. I then thought, I want to build my own Alexa skill, but I don't have any skills. 
So I went deep, knees deep into the AWS Amazon Alexa developer toolkit. That's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Try saying that. I haven't even had a beer yet. And I started learning how to code my own Alexa skill and I fell over. I fell flat on my face, so I started pairing with somebody and we got so far and we fell over. So we went into a mobbing mode and a mob of six, we built our first Alexa toolkit, uh, our first Alexa skill. And from that, from building it, I now understood how to test it. And I think this is part of the future for testers is understanding the stack, understanding the technology, how it's being built, because that drives the questions. That means you know how to test it. Um, what else? I actually think teams will need less testers because the trend is developers are picking up more testing and checking. So I think the more checking developers pick up, the less testers will be needed. And I hate to say that on a, 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 a you know call full of testers or test leaders, but I've seen it with my own eyes. When I joined Very, we had over 100 testers. And when I left, we had about 40. It's no coincidence. The reason being the tools are changing. The reason being devs are picking up those checks because they know they've got to build checks into the microservice pipeline or the through the API or around their unit che checks. So the amount of checking they're doing is improving and in increasing. So guess what? The amount of testing needed the UI and throughout the stack is reducing. <clears throat> so the tester would need to evolve to be an SME who can coach and do. And what about the test manager? I'm rushing through this because I want to get into the other panelists to get their feedback. The test manager role, I am evidence of what is happening to the test manager role. So I left very last Tuesday. Okay, so the role of the test manager is changing and evolving. Some say the test manager role is dead. I totally disagree. I think that's totally wrong. It's not. We need to be moving and shaping and changing. So how am I going to shape and change? Well, uh, there was a session last week with Chris Thacker where he spoke about going into being head of engineering. I think test managers make great test co uh, agile coaches. I think they make great scrum masters. The, the role of the test manager is still there, but there's many hats we need to wear. Those hats are changing and we need to learn how to change those hats really, really quickly. Um, the roles I'm going for now are not necessarily test roles. You know, I'm looking at the head of tech roles. I'm looking at head of agile roles i'm looking at agile coach roles as well as you good old you know test manager roles so in a nutshell i think that is a very quick dump of what's in my head around the future of testing and now i'd love the feedback of the panelists to probe a bit deeper and prove me wrong fantastic cheers for that lee um any of the panelists have any 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 comments <laughs> Oh, it's like being devil's advocate. So I'm not <laughs> not here to prove Lee wrong at all. <laughs> a bit of a bit of tennis now. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to agree with the, uh, with a lot of he said. Um, and when he was talking about what we've seen with changes, we saw a long time ago with the offshore model came. Then after a while, people didn't really make the offshore offshore model work. Then we went near shore, and then we went to onshore and especially with agile brought us more onshore and then we've you know now we've got a mix of onshore and offshore um and i think that what we what are the skills that we've that, that we've uh that we've built up with agile um where, where he said you know it, it was a lot better to have people face to face i think that now that you've now that everyone is pretty much offshore to a certain degree you know because you're not in the office you're not there working face to face people having to relearn those skills and that's, I think that's going to be, that'll, that'll open a few changes. So I think that you'll, you will have a mix of off, near and on like you did before, but more democratized and more all at the same level because everyone is working in the same way, the same fashion, you know, apart from time zones and apart from culture and background. So I, I think that the way, the way the future works is the way that it looks, I think, and I, I think that it's it's opened up the teams. It's it's opened up the agile teams to to people from different areas, which people would automatically oh my gosh, it's it's negative. You know, they'd be going for the cheapest option, but we've already learned that the cheapest option didn't work. You know, that's what the that's what the offshore model was driven back in my uh, Capgemini days. Hopefully, no one's here <laughs> on there from Capgemini, but you know, w the offshore model was all about getting to the clients and giving them the cheapest price. And then we realize it's all about quality. And now all of a sudden, I'm sure that Lee is quite possibly applying for jobs in London, Bristol, Birmingham, Bolton, all over, 
because if you are working from home, I'm, I've, I've talked to people, uh, recruiters, and I've seen that now companies are starting to say that location doesn't really matter, you know, especially in the short term and even in the long term, you'll be able to work from anywhere. So I don't know what others are thinking about that sort of location based. Cheers for that, Stuart. Stuart or Beth, any, any comments to add? So yeah, I think coming back to coming back to Lee's comment about you know the toolbox, I think this is this is how I've seen the role change massively over time. And that you know that some of that is moving into more agile ways of working and you know the the adoption of the, the iterative type approach to, to fail fast and this kind of thing. But I think we we're now in a world where people are actually putting um putting more emphasis on quality. So, and testing is part of that. And there's, you know, conversations are part of, you know, how we build quality in early, having, you know, collaborating and stuff like that. And I think, you know, from, from you know, what Lee was saying that, you know, the role of what would normally be the tester, i.e. you test the software, tell us where it's not working, is now around how we build quality in and really championing that with our engineers, our our product owners, our, you know, our stakeholders, and, and really getting people to think about those things more and more. You know, the, the automated checks that we put in place, you know, they can be done by our engineers. You know, that, that's why we want to shift left. They're the things that are, you know, are more simple to do, and that's not mocking anybody that codes, right? That's, it's the it's fact that you know, if you can code, you can write these tests. Um, sorry, these checks. So I think the real, the real um, benefit then comes from explore, exploratory nature type testing techniques, really building and architecting solutions that are testable as well. And that's a real, you know, a real big thing that we focused on is how do we build for testability? So ensuring that the guys are involved in those architectural conversations, whereas before it just been, here's a diagram of what it looks like, crack on. You know, now they're involved in those conversations and the forefront of that is how we would test it. So I think, you know, naturally those things are going to evolve more and more. Yes, you know, naturally I think there will be less um, sort of pigeonhole testers, if you like. But that, and, and I think the evolution of their skill sets with the mindsets they already carry. I, I love this world, right? I, I, I keep saying to my guys, the world is your oyster because the breadth of knowledge you can gain in this space you can turn your hat to anything. You can, you can move yourself into a DevOps engineer role. You could go into engineering. You could go into coaching. You can, you can basically do anything you want, right? So don't, you know, don't ever think that you're, you're not going to have something to do in the future because absolutely you can. And I think that's something that's really important to remember. The breadth of knowledge we have and learn through, through testing and QA is, is so vast. It's, it's crazy. For sure. Cheers for that, Stuart. Um, I think when last time when we when we spoke last week, um, I think it was Yuli that mentioned that, uh, especially when it like even with with testing in general, the testers' role rather than just doing the actual testing themselves might actually move towards more of a coaching role, yeah. um, and sort of like uh, sort of progressing in that way. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think that the test coaching is is key. So stop me if this sounds familiar to anybody who's who's been dropped from a waterfall to an agile world but we grab up a tester from a waterfall world on a friday and on a monday we go right you're going into this agile team we drop them in and all of a sudden they go from being i don't know let's call it a, a functional manual tester to an agile team where everyone in the agile team expects them to know everything about testing they need to be a, a test manager a test architect a test performance tester a test security tester test automation tester yeah, anything that has a word test in it, they're meant to understand it. And there's the, the reality is, they don't. Because I, I've not met a single test that ticks all of those boxes in all my life. I've never met a test manager that's ticked all those boxes in all my life. So the role of the coaching is really important because if we do want the devs to pick up that checking and they are best placed to do that, we have to coach them. So the tester has to be really comfortable with pairing with devs and encourage them to do that. And that thing about coaching the business as well, that's just as important. So the shift left is your developer and building in testability, as Stuart Day said, but the shift right and coaching, being able to engage the business and coach them to understand tech, coach them to understand how they can add value because people in the business, again, will be the right people to test the product rather than a tester or the squad or a developer. So this coaching thing 
that the testers have to move into and test managers is absolutely key because I don't think there's many people in an agile squad that can do that. I think our skills suit us to do that. We usually send, see the product from beginning to end, don't we? We're usually the only people in a project that sees the, the finished products. Developers write their little slither and off it goes in the old world. Now testers see everything. Because our skills are around question asking, I think that breeds the coaching role. And my prediction will be that maybe in three, four years' time, testers' hands on testing will probably be in the 20 to 30% mark. And the other 70% will be the question asking, the coaching, the pairing with devs, the pairing with developers, setting up bug bashes for the business to come in and, and do their bit. I think that will be the role of the tester. You know, understanding, becoming that T-shape as well. Be a tester, but understand everything else that's going around you. With that being said then, so I think it's quite interesting, like sort of understanding whose responsibility it is to sort. So say if you were to bring that, that sort of um, process into an organisation, would it be on the test manager to essentially go to the, the people above and say, this is what testers can do or how, like, what, what, what would your thoughts on that be? I think test managers, part of the test manager role is to sell visions. We have to be salespeople. Um, I'm forever selling ideas and selling change. And yes, it um, to take the, the other people in tech on board because when people's roles change, you can't just do it in silo because that's what usually leads to failure. You've got to you know, communicate, sell the new vision, exp explain the why. Why are we doing this? It's because, because software is so complex now. A tester can't be held accountable for quality. It's the whole bloody team, right? So that is a message. So the why is it's complex. The why is testers don't have all the skills, but they can definitely own the discussion and be the champion. As someone said earlier, someone said they need to be the champion. I think it's Stuart Day. Absolutely nailed on correct. So you've got to sell the why. We're doing this because of these reasons. Code is complex. Testers don't have all the skills, but guess what? The squad usually do. And if not, there's friends of the squad you can pull in to help. Fantastic. Cheers for that, Lee. Um, I think we, we will move on to the, to the last topic now. So we've got the last 10 minutes, and I think it's, uh, it's quite an important one moving forward as well. So obviously with, with yourself, Stuart, there's a lot, uh, a lot sort of going on, and uh, I know a lot of companies are still recruiting people, whether it's been completely remote or whether the interviews have been um, in a sort of socially distanced environment. But what, what do you think has to change in regards to recruitment, whether that's the actual process or what you um j just how you you do it essentially what are your thoughts on that yeah so i think before we kind of go into how recruitment's um been affected um over the last couple of months or whatever i think my view on the, the types of people that you know i want to come and work within the teams that we you know for dunham or wherever i've i've, I've, I've um, recruited for over the years has changed and it comes back to what we were just saying in terms of how things have evolved and, you know, the focus is for me now is more on not so much the technical capabilities of somebody, but the mindset and the want and desire to, you know, um, come into the organization and champion the quality um, statement. And, you know, so I'm really looking for that kind of thing when I'm, you know, I'm looking um, to recruit somebody now. Yeah, technical skills are important, but we've got engineers that can help with those things. And if anybody with the right aptitude can, you know, and they want and want and desire can can learn those things and you know we, we will support them in doing so so i think what's really been the challenge for for us is um, because of because of you know very our focus of, of, of when we recruit in this space is, is very much on the personality of the person you know what they bring to the team in, in terms of liveliness and the mindset when you're in a room with somebody you can quite quickly gauge that and i think you know, um, there's, there's, you know, in terms of the questions you might ask, or actually, for example, I did not um, somebody that joined us, or I offered a role to just pre lockdown. Um, I wasn't in the interview with him. Um, I did a telephone interview with him very quick, you know, 10 minutes just to gauge, you know, to, um, to get to know kind of thing. And then uh, members of the team did the interview and I wasn't available. So I said, look, I'd like to meet him, just you know, let him come back. And actually, all I was really wanting, I wanted him to grill me. I didn't want to grill him. It was not about me finding more out about him. I, obviously, I was talking to the guy and you know, got more to know him. But I wanted him to grill me and really show his enthusiasm for you know, learning more about the organization, learning more about what we do, and then thinking about how he can help contribute to that. 
Um, and that's quite difficult to, to do when you're doing things remotely like we are now. Um, and uh, we've, we've had to onboard people um, since we've been into lockdown. And we've had to do some, some recruitment as well in the early days. We, have, we did pause recruitment um, and we're just picking it back up again. So we're having to face into this again now. Um, and I think the, the two levels in, in terms of if, te te you know, if, if you want to test somebody technically, it's, easy, it's just as easy to do it as online as it is sit, sit there in a room with them and, and, and you can pair up with them and stuff like that. We have the technology, that's easy. Coming back to Beth's point earlier, a, a face on the end of the screen doesn't necessarily bring across somebody's personality. And actually, I, you know, in the interviews that I was doing early on, I, had, I was finding myself kind of going back into old modes of interviewing to try and draw, draw people out and try and get them to talk. And that didn't feel natural anymore. It was quite a horrible feeling. It was almost like you, I felt sorry for the person on the other end. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of how we, how we you know, um, relate to the person on the other end of, of the call, we need to be more mindful that actually for them, this is, this is a new thing. You know, normally they'd be in a room and yes that's that's nerve-wracking right but we have different ways that we can make people feel comfortable we can crack a joke we can get them a bottle of beer you know whatever it whatever it takes right we can kind of make people feel more comfortable just by them being in the room and, and you know feeling the, the 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 relaxation in the room on the end of a video it's going to be more nerve-wracking um and we we need to think about that and have the empathy there um, and, and I really adapt in terms of how we, we kind of conduct ourselves and, you know, um, uh, almost sometimes you're going to need to kind of pull information, encourage information out of people just to, to get them going, get them talking. Um, and I think, you know, if, if we can do that more and more and be very, in, in, in terms of how, you know, how things are going to change, that there's going to be a lot more remote working, no doubt. Therefore, there's going to be a lot more interviews that we have to do in this way, a get to know you sessions, onboarding, all those kind of things. We need to adapt that approach and you know, have that empathy on the other end of the, of the camera um, and think of different ways that we can make people relax. Um, and that's not going to be easy. And you know, we, 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 we kind of, what we do now is um, in the interviews we have done, we've gone we've done a basically five minutes, just tell me about yourself. Don't, I don't care about what you've done work-wise that doesn't bother me, right? Tell me about yourself and I'll tell you a bit about myself. And we just kind of just open it up like that and just, you know, relax into it. And then we just kind of talk through and, and make it a conversation. And that seems to have worked much better. Awesome. Cheers for that, Stuart. Um, Beth, I think uh, we'll come over to you. So what are your thoughts? Is there anything that you've, um, anything that you can think of that might, what any sort of process you might have in place uh, for recruitment moving forward and how how that could be beneficial i guess in terms of the uh, process yeah so i think i think like most companies we kind of um if if it was in flight we've carried it through um we probably need to be braver about recruiting um and facing into this new future um and and certainly like like Stuart was saying, you, you need to be maybe more creative about how we conduct these interviews to get the best person, to get the best idea of what what you're actually doing, um, and you know because it, it it can be quite intimidating just sitting here on this this whole screen face to face kind of thing. You know, you you can't just go for a coffee and 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 sit down and have a chat anymore. Um, so yeah, I think I think certainly it's it's something that that all companies are, are having to look at and review and and decide where their priorities lie. Yeah, for sure. I think that's quite a uh, quite an important point, and it's one of these where I always think anyone who you're going to be interviewing, I think with those processes in place, you can't have something that's sort of a blanket cover option just because everyone is so different. Everyone will be a lot more comfortable in different environments and whatnot. Um, but but yeah, Lee or Stuart, have you got anything to say on on, on recruitment and how how it might how you might have to change your approach? Or um, so I, I can look at this from both sides because I'm going through the interview process now, as well as interviewing people. So I asked a question today in an interview, which was, "Have you got a video of your office?" Because I, I want to see when we come out of lockdown. I want to see the bloody office. You know, if it's a, if it's a shit hole, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to be working the shit out. Well, no one does. Um, 
Uh, and half the companies I'm been in, having interviews with, um, I've actually been in their offices through presenting and doing meetups, mm. but the other half I haven't. So if my advice to anybody on the phone line now or, or on the call is if you are a recruiting manager and if you do get a chance to go into the office in the next couple of weeks, get a video, get a video of the office that you can share with candidates so they can see what they're going to be coming back into because whiteboard space is really important to me. And if you're a leader and if you've got to change or coach agile teams, whiteboard space is really key. So when I said, what's your whiteboard space like? The guy who interviewed me had only been in the office one day before lockdown. He couldn't answer. <laughs> so he was like, you know what? I don't know. I need to go back in and have a look. Um, so I think my one bit of advice for recruiting is get that video done so you can share it with people um, so they can see what they're going to be coming into. All they're doing is looking at your picture on, or your background and thinking, well, what am I coming into? So that would be the only thing I'd add there. Awesome. Cheers for that, Lee. Stuart, have you got any comments? Um, we, we haven't done any recruitment yet, so this is only off what I would what I would be sort of leading with. I, generally, the way I, you know, as everyone said, it's more about the people um, and how, when they're working on your team. You can see the CV, but it's just the conversations and chatting with them. And, and as has been pointed out, different people like different styles of interviews. So I, I, like, I do like to keep it quite relaxed um, mm. in my interviews. Uh, but I think I have been thinking, especially driven by this, is some of the the, not the exactly conversation, but just trying to understand what their home, once you get more onto advanced and as a reassurance to them. So I don't want them to tell me this information, but I want to reassure them that whatever their home life setup is, that if you are taken on board, then we will take that into consideration. So in the way that you shouldn't, you know, you can't ask and you should never be asking di different questions and, and just having a blank CV is a really good way to do it. So you don't, and, mm. and you only understand and judge them on the merits. But if I, you know, if, if they tell me once, if they're sort of worried about, well, I'm only in a small, as a, I think Fiona said, with a, a room with two teenagers and four mm. cats or, or, <laughs> To the opposite end, oh, I've got uh, an office in the garden next to the swimming pool. You know, whatever their situation is, if they let me know and become a lot more flexible about it. Yeah. And, yeah. Awesome. Um, well, yeah, so really, really good points there, guys, I think. Uh, and Beth, obviously. I think... Um, with that, so we are coming up to the to the hour mark, and I could appreciate everyone. Um, <laughs> I can see Beth itching to get back off to to sort out that delivery. So um, I will say thank you to to all the panelists. I really really appreciate it. Obviously, it's been uh, one of our uh, one of our first sort of test events online. Uh, I know with Rick and Jonathan as well in the chat, I've got some pretty big boots to fill. So cheers to everyone that's come along. Um, we do these events quite often. Um, so even when we get back to the office, I'm sure there'll be things online because obviously our reach expands quite a lot. I'm always keen to, to hear about interesting topics that people want to listen to. So if you do have any, feel free to share it with me and I'm sure I'll be able to get people, um, people along to any particular topics whatsoever. Um, but yeah, I've really, really enjoyed it. If you, if you, if you enjoyed it yourself, even if like you could support with just a LinkedIn post or whatever it might be, just to, just to support, because I'd really appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure we'll be in touch very soon with a, uh, with another, another event, but, uh, thanks again to everyone for coming and we'll, uh, we'll catch up with all you guys soon.